Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm your host, Mary Fran Johnson, CEO of Mary Fran Johnson Media. This video show and podcast is produced by CIO.com and the digital media division of Foundry, which is an IDG company. Our sponsor for today's episode is Savient, which is a leading provider of identity security for organizations that are responding to increasing cyber risk. Savient's Enterprise Identity Cloud offers customers greater visibility, control, and intelligence to defend against threats, while also remembering to empower users with the access that they need to digital technologies and tools. If you'd like to learn more, visit Savient.com. We're streaming live to you right now on LinkedIn and our CIO channel on YouTube. And I cordially invite our viewers to join in today's conversation by submitting questions of your own. We have editors that are watching the chat streams on both LinkedIn and YouTube, and we'll be happy to pass your questions along to me and my guest which I'm very pleased to welcome to our studio today, is Karen Higgins Carter. She is the Chief Information and Digital Officer at Gilbane Building Company. Gilbane is based in Providence, Rhode Island, and it's a national construction and real estate development company and one of the largest family-owned, privately held firms in the U.S., the company is also a global leader in facility management and integrated construction services with about 3,000 employees and an estimated revenue of $6.5 billion last year. Karen joined Gilbane in October of 2022, bringing with her more than 25 years of experience in technology leadership and innovation, mainly in banking and financial services. Her expanded role at Gilbane includes optimizing the value of innovation across the company and also encompasses all of the digital, advanced analytics, AI, technology, and cybersecurity strategies. Before she got to Gilbane, Karen was the CIO and Executive Vice President at Webster Bank in New York City, where she steered the commercial bank through four years of transformation, including its merger with Sterling Bank Corp. Before that, she held a number of IT and business leadership roles at uh, several financial industry leaders, including MUFG, which is the U.S. division of Mitsubishi's UFJ Financial Group, and also J.P. Morgan Chase and General Electric. Karen also currently serves as an independent director on the public board of the International Money Express Incorporated, and she's on a private board for the U.S. subsidiary of Atsuka Pharmaceutical Americas. She is a very accomplished CIO, and we're very happy to have you here. Thanks for joining well, me today, Thanks for Karen. having me, Mary Fran. I am always intrigued by the stories of CIOs who switch industries, uh, as you did, moving from big financial enterprises to a field like building and construction. Um, what inspired you to change your career direction toward an industry that, we have to admit, has never <laughs> been a leader in the use of technology for business benefit? And obviously, those things are changing. So tell us about what drew you to Gilbane and what the inspiration to change careers was. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I think I had spent, as you had covered, uh, a long, long time in all aspects yep. of financial services, be it mm -hmm. banking, hedge funds, investing, right. um, commercial non-bank financial services. And I felt mm -hmm. as though I really was looking for a new challenge on how do I take what I had learned about digital transformation in an industry that is far ahead mm -hmm. of others yeah. and apply that to apply those lessons and that experience and that skill set yeah. to an industry that was earlier on the transformation curve. And so you really can't find an industry that's earlier on the transformation curve. <laughs> I was just wondering bank, about that. Bank yeah. construction, and, and for many reasons, it's mm -hmm. there's a physical nature to the work. Um, 
transformation, digital transformation has by and large bypassed those types of companies and those types mm -hmm. of roles. Things that have a lot of hands in yeah. them are not necessarily disrupted as easily. But there's tremendous opportunity given that construction has remained about stable in productivity for, I don't know, the oh. last hundred years. Yeah. So there's a tremendous opportunity. And I was looking to really recharge and mm -hmm. accelerate my development by putting my skill set into a different context. Well, it's easy to look at construction and building trades and think that it would be just like the manufacturing sector. Do people often make that erroneous assumption or are there elements of that that are quite true? Uh, it is definitely an erroneous assumption. I think mm -hmm. it's one thing that I've learned and is also uh, a challenge as well as a strength of Gilbane is it's there's a very local ness to the the business so for example oh, sure. local mm -hmm. conditions local soil conditions they differ mm -hmm. across the globe and across the u.s uh different uh trade contractor pools of resources that we can use mm -hmm. as part of our projects local building codes are different and so there is an element of localness such that each project that we do is almost custom in and of itself. And oh. trying to apply a manufacturing analogy to that, I think, can, can be uh, somewhat misleading. Yes, because manufa yes, manufacturers are, but then again, um, Gilbane has a global presence. You're Correct. not just working in the US. I know you have uh, well more than 400 construction and building projects underway. What is it that Gilbane does overseas? What is the uh, It's primarily element? our federal mm -hmm. uh, division where we serve the Department of Defense mm -hmm. in uh, locations, uh, Palau, Japan, uh, Germany, okay. uh, and select locations. So we go where the Department of Defense is building okay. facilities. All right. Well, and I, um, in checking out a little bit about Gilbane's history, you know, being the largest privately held company in your industry, um, it also shows up on a list when you look up the top 10 or 20 contractors in the yes. U.S. Yeah. It's number 10. On yeah, we're there. big. Yep, you're very big. <laughs> we're big. Uh, we built big things. So. That's a list led by Bechtel, Turner Construction, AECOM. What are a couple of examples of what Gilbane has built? Mm. Oh, um, the Air and Space Museum mm -hmm. in D.C. Uh, one of my favorites, the Herb Brooks Arena in Lake Placid. It was the site of the 1980 Miracle on Ice yeah. game. Uh -huh. So that's always Wonderful. a, a, a mm -hmm. sentimental favorite. Uh, currently, we're building the Buffalo Bills stadium in buffalo as well as uh, large hospitals yeah indiana university health being one of those as well so mm -hmm. we build very large complex yes. projects well and and you mentioned the local nature of construction and building and when you look at the entire it's still very big in the 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 gdp it's like construction itself yes. is almost four percent yeah the, the sector total. is very large mm -hmm. um somewhat fragmented uh, yeah, so I, would, large, I would even argue yes. very fragmented, right? <laughs> large general contractors yeah. as well as all the way down to, to smaller organizations. So and it employs 7 million people across yes. the U.S. Yes. Not all working for Gilbane, but, no. <laughs> but several thousands. Now, yeah. it, given all that, I mean, I had to look up to find a list of the big contractors. I mean, Bechtel probably occurred to me, but the average citizen isn't really all that aware. How did you end up being, uh, how did Gilbane become your target when, oh. <laughs> you, when you decided that, you know, I've done banking, I've done finance, I've got years under my belt. It's It does get to be the same kind of work after a while. I can understand yeah. wanting to go after that. So why was it, why Gilbane? Yeah, well, such a great question. I, um, I'm an engineer by training. Ah, and so that, that it did. Mm -hmm. it, you know, yeah. the work definitely appeals to me. Gil Bain recruits a lot of project engineers out of the types of curriculums that mm -hmm. I took as an undergraduate. So there was some sense of familiarity uh, there. Um, and so I'm thinking, okay, I'm moving from banking mm -hmm. and I'm going to go into construction. <laughs> Where do I start? So uh, first I talked to my dad 
about it. Mm -hmm. And he works in the industry. And at first he thought I was oh, crazy, gosh. probably, you know, a similar reaction to when I told him I was going to be a mechanical engineer undergrad. He was like, are, yeah. are you crazy? Always oh, very supportive. But you yeah. know, the, the yeah. initial reaction is she's going into construction. So, oh. <laughs> um, so then he thought about it. And yeah. he said, well, you know, have you considered Gilbane? Because he knew mm -hmm. of Gilbane by reputation as being um, a large contractor, strong values, mm -hmm. strong safety, culture. Mm. Um, and I think he was a little concerned about, you know, his daughter going into this industry um, that is, is not known, thinking? yeah, not mm -hmm. known for one that has a lot of women, uh, particularly well, in leadership. Yeah. Gilbane is differentiated from that perspective. Um, and so I searched my LinkedIn network like any good job searcher would do. Sure. And I came up with exactly zero contacts. In terms of, like, well, I really like my network is heavily developed in financial services sure and technology, is, yeah, but yeah. but not necessarily in a different industry. Yeah, and so and um, that just spurred you on. That that did. was not that was not a sign from the universe. Like Karen, pick another field. No, I think no. You, you have to try. You have to try, right? I, so yeah. so I like to say I, I somewhat barged my mm -hmm. my way in. So I I was able to derive the email of both the chairman and the CEO of the building company. And I just mm -hmm. sent them a note. I said, you know, here goes nothing. I, you know, sure. I'm, I've got nothing to lose other than where I am already. Okay. And so I drafted yeah. them a note saying, this is my background. This is mm -hmm. why I'm looking to move into your industry. And if you have any roles open with these types of titles, I would be hmm. interested in talking. And and Tom Gilbane, our, our fourth generation chairman, oh. uh, got back to me within, you know, a couple of hours and oh, said, indeed, wow. we do have a role and uh, we'd be interested interested in chatting. So, what, a, and what a wonderful coincidence, right? There, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, um, well, and you'd mentioned to me too, as we were getting ready for this, that you really believe that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're rate of learning starts to level off and, you know. It's, yes. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's really easy to do that in financial services and banking. A lot of, um, a lot of the work d does start to feel very similar in terms of core mm -hmm. banking, transformations, cloud migrations, regulatory work, opening up digital channels for consumers, applying that to commercial. It's, it's yeah. somewhat of the same playbook. And mm -hmm. so I personally felt that I wanted a challenge. Mm -hmm. And your comfort zone will kill you if you stay in there for too long. And yeah. so I think I've achieved it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> sure. Well, well, good. And you've been there almost a year and a half now. Yeah. Okay. So good. We've got lots of good stories to talk about here. But I wanted to dive into um, the innovation and creative problem solving aspects mm. of it, which was because uh, I often ask CIOs, you know, well, what does digital transformation mean in your industry? And I rather suspect that in building and construction, I would get kind of a blank look. Where oh, people, not at all. Really? No, okay. Not at okay. all. I think in terms yeah, talk of to that. <laughs> yeah, I think the types of people in construction are incredibly smart, incredibly mm -hmm. skilled problem solvers. So mm -hmm. I am constantly amazed at what it takes to actually deliver one of our projects. So the complexity uh. Uh, with meeting a schedule, meeting a budget, managing safety on a site. It's it's stunning to me mm -hmm. to see uh, the level of effort and the level of care that is taken and needs to be taken to keep people safe on one of our job sites. Yes. Uh, enormous uh, complexity every single day. And so people who do that for a living mm -hmm. tend to be incredibly creative problem solvers. So sometimes, okay. you know, what I what I hear at Gilbane sometimes is, well, I'm just a dumb builder, you know, you're the you're the technologist. And I and I have to say all the time yeah. that if you can build a building, yeah, you can understand what I do. We're just working in a different vocabulary. So that's kind of a don't feed me that line. You know, that's, that's somebody <laughs> no, I think it's yeah. it's very humble. It's it's oh. I think it's it attracts a, uh -huh. a, a um a humble persona to do ah. this type of work. And so you know and back to the point on on innovation, yeah. the ability to connect a problem with a solution. So I think we mm -hmm. know the problem set in construction extraordinarily well. Mm -hmm. I think the art is prioritizing what is the most important to problem problem to solve. Okay. Now, given the opportunity that that opens up 
when we solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And then connecting with various solution providers, be it through venture capital, startups, educational institutions, uh, mm -hmm. the world of wonderfully creative people in terms of opportunities to connect those to the problem. So we have a lot of data, we have deep knowledge of the problem mm -hmm. set. Startups, VCs, et cetera, have a high level understanding yeah. of that. Um, but a lot of creative thought in terms of emerging technologies and how to apply them to our set. So it's really, it's a bit of an iterative process okay. and a dance to be able to match that problem with solution and then be able to scale that. And that sounds so that is something very f familiar to you in your background as a mechanical engineer and then sure. later as a CIO in financial services. Correct. Yeah. Um, how did you get, What did you have marching orders coming in? You, you got the CEO and you got along. He's fourth generation running the company. Did he know what he wanted in uh, a CIO coming in from the big financial and banking sector? Uh, it, it, t tell us what the marching orders were like at the beginning. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mm. so much call it marching orders. I think there was, a, I stepped into an environment that was incredibly open minded about ah, okay. defining uh, where value is added. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the common theme mm -hmm. across any type of CIO role is. Well, that's a great point. It's mm -hmm. how do I, how do I bring value? I think understanding right. the financials of the company, the needs of the customers, the short term and the long term strategic opportunities, the risks that need to be managed. Mm -hmm. And then comparing that to what's the current state. And then what are the okay. capabilities across that domain of technology? technology, data, digital, innovation, to be able to prioritize exactly what adds value, both mm -hmm. in the short term and in the long term. I think that's the art, really, of any uh, technology leadership. That's that's role, a very good point. Yes, is you got, and sometimes you have to ask numerous questions to get at what adds value, because yeah. what initially is presented of, hey, we need to fix X, Y, Z. Yes. There's a thought process behind that. Sure. In we need to be able to aggregate this data. Mm -hmm. There's a thought process underneath that as well. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, our clients are asking for this. Okay. And it takes us a while to respond to that ask. Okay. So we want to be faster. That's a cycle time thing. Okay. Who else has this capability? Is it differentiating for mm -hmm. Gil Bain? How much do we have to invest in it? So I think asking the second and third question and really understanding where the value yeah. is and what is the the force behind the thing that you're being asked to do okay. is uh, it's a skill okay. that you need to bring. Talk about some of your initial successes, that things that happened in the first year uh, as you got to Gilbane. I would say a couple, uh, you know, basic things like upgrading our ERP. Um, oh. It, like many places, heavily which customized. Is, which is not trivial. No, it's not, it's <laughs> not trivial. Itself, yeah. um, it's just a lot of customization, a lot of mm -hmm. just putting rigor uh, in, in the review of that. Mm -hmm. um, establishing my leadership team. Oh, which okay. Which I'm very excited uh, about the leadership team that we have in place now. Yes. And building trust with our project teams, with our business units, by mm -hmm. creating transparency to what we do and why mm -hmm. and and really establishing the mantra that we're here to help and not judge right i know it's like the, the old joke about you know the government inspector what you know i'm here from the government and i'm here to help you know <laughs> exactly. when, the, when they're saying i'm here from it and i'm here to help you know people tend to like be rolling their eyes right um right but they no, so you really have to they kind shouldn't, of dig by in. god you have you to have to it. dig in yeah. and, and help i think we've we've established um our cybersecurity risk appetite with our board. So it's one of the ah, things that I took okay. from banking. And because uh, yeah. as you can imagine, cyber mm -hmm. is highly regulated in, in that industry, not so much in construction, but I find that to mm -hmm. be a very useful starting point for cybersecurity, which is what are the unique uh, risk that can be realized mm -hmm. in this industry and how would we, what are the threats that would act on which vulnerabilities? And okay. how would we realize those? Mm -hmm. Getting some agreement uh, amongst the leadership team as well as the board on uh, what those are and developing mm -hmm. our plan. 
Yeah, can you tell to mitigate those specific risks? Yeah, can you call out one as an example, not oh, specifics sure. of what you did, but just something uh, yeah, that was a, uh, a specific risk, low hanging fruit, something that you're like, oh, we need to fix this. Oh, sure, mm -hmm. um, multi factor authentication. Oh, uh, okay. phishing susceptibility. One mm -hmm. of the biggest risks in construction is business email compromise and oh, misdirected payments and uh -huh. wire fraud. Because we have, of as course. you can imagine, for one of for mm -hmm. our large projects, we have a lot of money moving uh, from uh -huh. our owners to Gilbane, from Gilbane to our trade contractors, yeah. and so frequently we find um, impersonations of Gilbane personnel requesting mm -hmm. changes to payment instructions happens oh. all over the place, but particularly construction is targeted. I didn't realize for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would have and thought so, it would be more of a banking financial services company problem, but yeah. it's also big in construction. Yes, it <laughs> okay. is. And so raising the awareness of our people, because mm -hmm. people are the first line of defense for cybersecurity yes. and often the last line of defense, but certainly mm -hmm. the first line of defense and raising awareness that we're not the team of no, we're right. here to enable you. Yeah. And we're here to help you join the mission of protecting the company. Mm -hmm. And then guess what, you'll learn some things to protect yourself. Yes, that's always a great upside benefit right. with employees right. where they realize, oh, I should take a look at how we're doing this at home. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, that's great. Well, you had mentioned all well, you'd mentioned the uh, success of building up your leadership team. Yeah. But I think you also told me that you didn't come in with a phalanx of people that you were bringing from past lives and others. You were essentially, that was something you were rather proud of, that yeah. you came in and you didn't say, and here's a whole bunch of, what, what did you talked about? Everybody having a special mug and being in a special club that you didn't yeah, like that, that. that feeling I, of... I, I, so yeah. that's a, that's an, that's an issue of inclusivity, isn't it? Well, it's yeah. a, there's a certain ick factor, I think, to to bringing like your that. own team in, yeah. right? Because you're trying to build relationships in the company that you've landed in, right. yeah. And you don't need people to be like, oh, there she goes, hiring her own folks. What's wrong right. with us, right? And yeah. and it creates. Um, intended or unintended, it can mm -hmm. create an us and them environment of like, here are the new people to fix all the problems that the old people, Which you know, we're not capable. Anyway, between IT and other units of the business. Well, right. Yeah. Typically, they're yeah. deeply rooted. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's many reasons why. Uh, a technology organization can mm -hmm. be underperforming. And it's really, really important to understand what those root causes are. It's a little bit like weeding yeah. your garden. And so I think it's mm -hmm. it's a little bit of an illusion of improvement to bring in uh, your whole team. It's and a lot of sound and thunder, but it's yeah, not exactly. getting a and, lot and done. And so you feel like, yeah, we're going to empower them and, and you give them a certain status, be it with a different mm -hmm. mug or a, you know, a larger <laughs> yeah. monitor. I kid you yeah. not. I mean, I've seen this in my career where the, you the, the chosen yeah. team gets their special monitor mm -hmm. or they get to use a Mac and other people don't. Yeah. And, and I just don't find that real productive over the long term. You must remember the era of like the special innovation units or the innovation <laughs> teams. Yeah. Um, most of them didn't really work out. Or the e-business team. Do you remember the e-business oh, sure. teams from the, early, e from the early 2000s? And we're like, yes. isn't, isn't this isn't that I know. what aren't, we just do? Right? All, isn't the E for electronic? Aren't we already doing <laughs> right. like this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I would say it is important to have a protected innovation fund. Okay. And it is important mm -hmm. to bring Bring people into that group and cycle them back out because mm -hmm. people who come into the group come with knowledge, particularly in our business of what's in the field. And then people that get cycled out see a whole new wor world of opportunity of where to apply mm -hmm. their goals. Um, but in general, I am not a fan of, of creating the separate transformation team. Okay. You know, unless your goal is to cannibalize your primary line of business. I just I think right. again, it's an illusion of progress because you need to invite people mm -hmm. with you yeah. on the journey because mm -hmm. you need the whole company to come yeah. uh, on that journey with you. So how did you, you'd mentioned that you're very proud of the work you've done in building up the leadership team. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. What did yeah. you do? What are you, do what is that team doing differently now than maybe was happening two years ago before you got there? Sure. Well, I think first mm -hmm. of all, I've, retained our cybersecurity leader 
uh, who works always, primarily always with a our, good move. Yeah. Yes. No, I was really mm-hmm. excited to have a very strong cybersecurity leader uh, when mm-hmm. I landed into the role. So that was very helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, my head of data AI and analytics actually joined the company uh, mm-hmm. previously from Cisco uh, and joined in HR analytics because construction oh, is a people business. And so, of course, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So HR analytics, um, people first is is the first pillar of our strategic plan. It is okay. a people business, so it made sense that we had strong talent in that area. Um, I took uh, the leader of our New York City virtual design and construction team Mm -hmm. to lead operations tech. He had spent many years in that role, by default was Mm -hmm. becoming a leader of technology that is specifically used in our building operations, Mm -hmm. and so brought him onto the team. I had one external hire who Mm -hmm. I knew from GE, from the uh, the GE leadership program, uh, who had come from another construction company, so we had, you know, separated from GE wound yes. our way around and, I've, I've, and he came back. I've heard other CIOs refer to that as the diaspora. All of the uh, CIOs that got their start at GE. Oh, there's a lot of us. <laughs> there is a lot of you. I think at one, at one point, I think I had six or seven different GE CIOs that we were inviting to speak at our CIO yeah. events and that sort of thing. So you people are everywhere. They did we, some good we work are, at GE. It, we did yeah. some, it was such mm-hmm. a great time yeah. to be there. I think, you know, we, I I brought in, just finishing our last question, I brought uh, Mm -hmm. our head of innovation. Oh, Um, okay. She was formerly in BD in Mm -hmm. our New York City office. And so bringing that client perspective. Yeah, business development is what you mean. Exactly. Yes, Yes, business development. So bringing that client perspective into the team has been invaluable. So it's been a a great group. Mm -hmm. Now, is the, the tech team, the tech organization itself, has it grown since you've gotten there? Is it about the same size and just a little shuffling in terms of duties and that sort of thing? Yeah, it is about the same size Mm -hmm. um, with a partnership uh, with one of my vendors Oh, okay. uh, to help augment uh, some of the development work that we've prioritized for this year. I talk with a lot of CIOs who are multi-billion dollar companies and I'll say, so you must have about what, five, six hundred people in IT and they're always like, like, nope. No. <laughs> you know, nope. Very small team. We're small but mighty is Correct. what I hear a lot, you know, which, which I think is actually pretty great. Um, you would mention one of the problems that has to get tackled a lot in uh, building and construction is labor productivity. Yeah. And that that was something, that's something that's very high on your list of things you, you have underway. What can you tell us about um, how you've been able to apply more technology solutions to that. Yeah, I think, well, mm-hmm. it's it's a multifaceted mm-hmm. challenge, and, the, and it is simply we – there aren't enough skilled craft workers – to build all the buildings uh, Mm -hmm. that uh, Gilbane and our peers have uh, under development. So it's a challenge to uh, expand that opportunity from an economic inclusion perspective, which is an enormous priority and and goal for Gilbane, as well as apply technologies that do help us perform the building of the building. So Mm -hmm. um, tools that uh, help our superintendents manage the actual construction of the building is Mm -hmm. a really promising area for us, particularly in applying Uh some Gen AI to that to that area. Okay, good. You're launching into an area I was going to bring up next about Gen AI. Well, it's illegal not to talk about Gen AI. I, it seems like that. On a, you know, on a chat like it's, this. It's, it's almost a federal law these days. You know, you have <laughs> to talk right. about what you're doing with Gen AI or just AI in general. <laughs> right. Um, and th- so tell, tell us more about AI in building and construction and where it's being, because there are some sketchy areas where yeah. you have to be careful not to use yeah. artificial intelligence. Uh, so talk a little bit about the balance there and what you've been doing in that area. <laughs> yeah, so a couple things. Mm-hmm. We see two primary use cases. Mm-hmm. Um, the first is synthesizing large amounts of information and mm-hmm. making the first draft of, say, a proposal deal summary in mm-hmm. our development company. Um, we see significant a number of applications for that uh, type of use case. So we have a proof of concept uh, Mm -hmm. related to how we develop proposals. So how do we draw upon all of Gilbane's experience 
and mm-hmm. draft proposals um, in a consistent manner that really highlights the experience that we have. And so mm-hmm. that's that's one really set of use cases. For, kind of a curation of expertise. Yeah, summarization yeah. in that. Mm-hmm. I think the, the bet we're making is that the Gen AI capability plus the human in the loop is more effective mm-hmm. than just a human performing all of that work independently. Okay. The second use case that we, we see is in the whole co-pilot scenario, mm. not necessarily like the generic office, you know, Microsoft Office, mm-hmm. Office Worker co-pilot, but targeted toward our building superintendent. So, yeah, you were telling me about yeah. that. I think that's pretty fascinating. The fact, yes. Yeah. I, again, going back to they have an incredibly complex mm-hmm. job. Um, thousands of details, lots of questions coming mm-hmm. to them throughout the day. Yes. And it's a significant overhead to ho- have to go walk back to the trailer, look up, right. uh, look in your spec binder, project documentation, drawings mm-hmm. to come up with an answer, and then walk back to the site and, and provide ah. information to uh, the person who has asked the question. And so this particular proof of concept is uh, about synthesizing all of those uh, documents across various sources to answer a particular question okay. uh, that may come to the superintendent. And again, it's a combination of the tool mm-hmm. that can synthesize that information and the human who can look at how the answer was generated right. and say, oh, interesting. this okay. is accurate, or maybe there's a conflict between documents that mm-hmm. we then need to resolve. Okay. What's an example of an area where something like uh, chat GPT or any sort of AI enabled technology is not such a great idea? Things that maybe you've looked a little into and said, "Mm, yeah, I think I get a little bit concerned about some of any technology that is monitoring employee behavior. Okay. Uh, That, Mm -hmm. you know, one example can be in unsupervised learning if we have, say, a safety application that mm-hmm. identifies uh, a particular risky behavior uh, by a worker with dark skin, how oh, do I okay. know, yeah. which I do need to know in the role I'm in, mm-hmm. how is that model trained? Yes. Like how do how do we ensure what assumptions that assumptions are being made? Right. How yeah. do, you know, particularly if it's an unsupervised model, mm-hmm. are you training it to only then look at workers with with dark skin as potential um, folks who are performing unsafe acts? So I think employee mm-hmm. behavior has tremendous opportunity for bias, mm-hmm. and we need to be extremely careful about deploying those solutions. And I think all CIOs need to be extremely careful about deploying yeah. those solutions. Okay. So really, and mm-hmm. this is a whole area that is um, still evolving, mm-hmm. particularly uh, the third party risk management aspects of this. Oh, interesting. Yes, because I was gonna, I wanted to talk more a little bit more about how you saw AI affecting cyber risk risk programs. Yeah. Um, and the you had mentioned the opportunity for perspective is there, but for every innovation, you do have to take a risk. Yes. So it's, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, you know, you have to remember why you're there, right? You're there mm. to grow the company. Right. And you have to be able to take risks mm-hmm. in order to execute strategic plans. Mm-hmm. The most important thing is that you know what risks you are taking. Yeah. And what is your risk tolerance that is acceptable in light of what the strategic goal is? So Mm -hmm. risk is simply just the flip side of what your strategic plan is. Okay. So, you know, one of my pet peeves is innovation that is done absent of understanding what risk are we taking? So I think right there, I mean, there's a difference Mm -hmm. between being an innovator and just being dumb. (laughs) <laughs> and taking risks, you know, for no reason. And so really understanding what is the strategic goal? Mm-hmm. How does this innovation help us achieve that goal? What are the risks that are inherent in this innovation? Okay. And how am I controlling for them to an acceptable level of risk 
uh, such that we can proceed. And so making sure that you go through the rigor of that thought process versus just, you know, hire a team, give them different mugs and hire, you know, bigger <laughs> monitors and say, yeah. you know, hey, go take the sensitive data, yeah. share it with random third parties and, and right. stamp the, right. yeah. you know, stamp the card that you're innovating. <laughs> well, the... Um Everything from, uh, and you've, you mentioned this and a lot of other CIOs I've talked with about this have that everything from Gen AI on down essentially comes down to some regression analysis, uh, and, you know, data analytics that skills for that have been building up over decades yeah. in, in technology leaders. Um, and it, you know, I know that it's been fascinating to watch Gen AI especially catch the interest of business executives yeah. everywhere. I mean, why do you, why do you think it is um, when you look at all the enthusiasm around it right now, which can be a great thing for fueling yeah. innovation and all that, but there's also um, parts of it. Right? I remember we used to talk about the um, airline magazine syndrome where the CEO would be sitting in first class reading a Business Week story, and he'd come back and he'd say, well, how come we don't have a cloud? You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Talk about the how you kind of balance those expectations yeah. from your, your business leaders with your because you're coming in as the innovator and the one who knows technology and engineering how are you how are you kind of keeping everybody sane <laughs> well i think first of all it's important to recognize that chat gpt popularized ai it, it did not invent sure did. Yeah. chat gpt it did not invent gen ai or many other flavors yeah, yeah. of artificial intelligence so i think making sure that that's an important distinction um, they know that chat GPT can't build a building. No, that is, yeah, yes. I know. That, you that, made that we, point at one point. You're like, that's not going to happen. That was not hard to, yeah. to know. Chat mm -hmm. GPT cannot build a building. And, and again, it goes back to digital transformation has largely bypassed very physical yes. uh, work. Yes. Um, so, again, I think it goes back to what are your business goals? How does What role does innovation mm -hmm. play in those goals or not. Yeah. And then what are the possibilities for applying um, all kinds of solutions to those opportunities? Mm -hmm. And um, Gen AI is certainly more accessible now. And, and there's a flood of investment, as you can imagine, into yes. different yeah. types of use cases. But again, it always goes back to what is the value that you're delivering, because AI is expensive. You know, like the, yeah. the good old workhorse of predictive analytics may be oh. fine in certain use cases. So, well, we and I would probably yeah. say many. We used to enthuse about that so much. I yeah. mean, all the years that I was the editor in chief at CIO magazine, we had so much I mean, that was the that was the the, the oasis in the desert was getting every Everybody to predictive analytics, and <laughs> it never got business people as excited yeah. as Gen AI and all that stuff is getting them now. So I'm not, I'm not totally sure where that tick over point was. Right? Um, <laughs> do you find do you find you're having to like? calm people down about some of the capabilities of AI? No, I, I'm, no not, I'm not. They're pretty think, pragmatic. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a pragmatic crew that that. Yeah. Um, I think has a healthy skepticism mm -hmm. around inflated expectations because they're builders. They're different than bankers in that regard. And, and almost, in so many ways, right? But yes. <laughs> and, and almost, um, uh, I don't want to say easier to work with, but have mm -hmm. an appreciation of a craft of what it takes to build something. And, mm -hmm. and techno information technology and data and digital is simply my version of a craft, like carpentry, right. you well, know, electricians, good, yeah, that's plumbing, a great way to put yeah, it. structural yeah. engineers, the other types of crafts that we bring mm -hmm. uh, to actually do our work. Yeah. Now, um, I've been asking you a lot of questions about cybersecurity and that sort of thing. And part of that is because you are also something of an expert. A few years ago, during the pandemic, you went and got your CISSP. Uh, I'm trying to remember what that means. I remember oh, it's Certified a, Information Systems Security Professional. I'm so glad I didn't I try did, to roll that out. I, I would have gotten my, it wrong. You got I, your CISSP. I yeah. did get my CISSP. Yeah. I would not say it makes me an expert. 
Well, I, think, okay. I think there's very few experts in cybersecurity. It's such a broad that's field, true. and I that's would never true. want to represent myself right. as such. Um, but it's a little unusual for a CIO to go and get that credential, unless they're going to go to work for a big security vendor or something like that. But that was not why you did it. So talk talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, well, I did have a background in cyber, really starting at GE, mm-hmm. and in the late uh, 2000s, um, and as you know, GE was on the leading edge of all mm-hmm. things cybersecurity, just given the size and scale yeah. and nature of that business. So um, I find it really interesting as well as as logical. Um, and so I had the work experience, and I just think it is very challenging to be a strategic technology leader and mm-hmm. not understand what risks you are taking in pursuing those strategies and ah. not have a firsthand understanding of that. It's no different than a loan officer mm-hmm. not understanding how they are going to lose money on a particular okay. deal. I think you have to partner um, yeah. with your CISO and have a certain threshold level of understanding mm-hmm. of what they do uh, to be able to achieve that goal. Okay. There's another reason I got the CISSP, which was, as as you'd mentioned, it was the depths of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I'm all about supporting my team with training and development. Again, as you know, I'd only hired one external person. I have to invest in the team. Mm -hmm. And I want them, more importantly, to invest in themselves with their own time uh, in order to remain relevant and keep up Mm -hmm. uh, with technology. So... If I can take time out to to do a certification yeah, like that, right. if you can then, go back to school, then so right, exactly, they. go back that's to right. school, yes. and then so yes. can my team. Yep. Now, um, did that end up playing a role? Because your, I mentioned that your role has expanded; it's unique for Gilbane, and it may be unique for a number of other companies where you have all the related disciplines combined. You've got innovation, technology, traditional aspects, OT in the field, data analytics, AI, and of course cyber. Um, it seems like an almost undoable job. So, what is what is the benefit of having everything under that under your umbrella? Oh, I think it it clarifies responsibility significantly. Okay, it allows enough. us to mm-hmm. develop a unified strategy where uh, there isn't you know a dedicated a separate digital team that's separate from AI that's mm-hmm. separate from data. You know these things have to work together. Yes. <laughs> At the end, in order to deliver a product, Fair and enough. Yes. you know, if you give the AI team a problem, the solution will be an AI solution. You know, if you well, give the okay. same problem to a digital team, if it all will you be have is a, a hammer, user, yep, exactly. One, yeah. And so, I think mm-hmm. it's important. Um, it's helpful to have those related disciplines. Mm-hmm. I also don't think it's that unusual. I think back in, you know, back in the day, the the CIO role had all of those things. Before so, they started getting differentiated. Yeah, into, into the alphabet soup of, yes. of titles. And in fact, I think I saw something this past week. It was uh, published from a consultancy, like a little grid of like, well, uh-huh. CTO's here and the CIO, the chief innovation officer is here and the yeah, CIO's here yeah. and the CDO's here. And you kind of had to look at this matrix. And I thought, how funny it would be if you did that to a CFO role. You say, well, they don't oh. really know Treasury, and so we'll have to pull Treasury out, and they'll That's have to report here because Treasury is yeah. really important. And, uh, well, controllership and accounting, that's important, and I'm not so sure they can do that. And so yeah. we'll just make the CFO look like this. And I just think we we tie ourselves up into knots, and I don't know that it is particularly helpful with respect to pursuing I've, I've never had outcomes. the impression that all of the kind of the – and we know, you know, the eight kind of uh, research houses we're talking about where they are looking at, the, they're looking at making a whole lot of money mm-hmm. selling research and pronouncements to the business side of the C-suite about this relatively new position in their midst, the CIO. Right. I saw something the other day and, uh, you know, there's always like, is the CIO title done? Is it time to call it something else? And that it, it just, um, I think it's a way for people to keep spinning tops around the but, idea. But potentially, potentially. Potentially. I would say different businesses have different needs, right? Yes. I think it's, yep. it's a different structure at Otsuka than mm-hmm. it is at Gilvane for very good reasons because the pharma industry is a different yeah. industry and it's got data and analytics has a very different role in that environment than in construction. So Mm -hmm. I would say trying to 
solve the puzzle in abstract, mm -hmm. I don't find to be that practical. I and think I, you got to look at your business and what your needs are and who you got and well, make a structure that's that makes sense. That's often why I ask CIOs when I get talking to them, what does digital transformation or innovation actually mean to your industry right, right. now? What would that be? Because in retail, it's different from rental equipment, from banking and so forth. Um, I also think that a lot of the time, the, the research and the pronouncements coming out from the various pundits at these research firms are coming from people that have MBAs and have interviewed a lot of boards of directors mm -hmm. and have actually never done any of the roles themselves. Possible. And I, coming Quite out possible. of a journalism background, I know that <laughs> we were, you know, if a new editor in chief arrived and he had never been, and it usually was a he, he'd never been a reporter and he'd never been an editor, you were sort of like, well, what's he here to do? Yeah. You know, like, why is he got that job? So I, I think I, this is the whole skepticism thing that, you know, like I always bring in from the journalism side. I want to take advantage of, you mentioned Atsuka, mm -hmm. which is the pharmacy company that you are a, one of the board members. So I want to pivot over to your experience as a full-time working CIO plus who is also involved in two different boards, mm -hmm. one of them private and the other one public. Um, talk about what that has what has that changed in your own leadership mm. style? Has the board director work, uh, how has it expanded your view as a business leader? Oh, thanks. I think, you mm -hmm. know, I think the, the most important question that I have to ask myself is, how do I contribute? Well, here, yes. what's you know, what is what's the value my role? I bring? <laughs> what's yes. the value that yes. I bring mm -hmm. uh, to this board? To your question on how it's expanded my perspective, I think you get... Um, a firsthand view of the forces and the pressures on CEOs today. Mm -hmm. And the more that you can have an appreciation for that in my role, mm -hmm. the more that you can connect to what the company strategy is and why and shape your roadmap accordingly. Mm -hmm. I would also say it's interesting, the, the three organizations that I'm involved in, um, Otsuka is a, a very long cycle business specialist sure, in drug development, mental yeah. health and psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And that is a uh, high risk and very, very long cycle mm -hmm. uh, development cycles and commercialization and finally realizing a product with the goal of helping people. Mm -hmm. um, Intermax is extremely short cycle business as a money right. service business. And yeah. so how you lead and manage in those businesses is very different. And Gilbane mm -hmm. is somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And so how you think about how do I balance long-term and short-term objectives? How mm -hmm. do I make sure that I'm meeting the short-term objectives while I am building capabilities to support us in the long-term, uh, bringing together the pressures on the CEO, mm -hmm. the nature of the business uh, has been very helpful to me in terms of how do I craft our strategic priorities. That's great. The um, I remember some years ago, I was um, a couple of years ago now, I was writing um, a, a column for CIO.com and it was all about, it was called Boardroom Bound. And it was basically, um, I, I was kind of haranguing CIOs, even though they're working full time as CIOs, to start considering to absolutely get into the idea and start looking for a position on a public board. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are already involved with nonprofits, and that's a whole different ballgame, as we know. Um, but the idea that uh, so many of them I had talked to over the years had said that, well, you know, once I'm retired, I'm mm. going to go for that. But then I had just as many, especially the ones who have, were already on board, said by the time you're retired, it may be too late because you don't have that operational yeah. active business experience yeah. going on. Do you run it? Yeah, I know you've been involved in organizations like T200, yeah. which uh, encourages a lot of women leaders. Um, are you running into, so two questions here, are you running into a lot more of your CIO comrades who are part of T200 uh, who are already on boards. And also tell us more about the organization itself and why you got involved in it. Yeah, so thanks for the question. I'll start with the, the second one. Start with, okay, good. So um, T200 is an organization, 100% volunteer led mm -hmm. uh, with um, an initial goal of finding 
200 women CIOs or most senior technology leaders mm -hmm. in their companies. And we found it was hard to do. And uh, so T200 created the Lyft organization, which is the next generation of women leaders in technology, mm -hmm. solely for the mission of supporting and elevating their growth. Like we yes. think about who's, who's going to replace us yes. in our operating roles. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And I got involved because Suja, yes. who everyone knows Suja, yes. uh, going back to the beginning Suja of our conversation. Suja Chandrasekharan. Yes. Yes. I haven't, I don't think I've she, interviewed her on the show yet. She doesn't have a last name. Everybody, but she, everybody just knows just her as says Suja. Suja. <laughs> She's one of our CIO Hall of Fame members. Yep. From, back from one of her. I yep. finally met her uh, after a number of years. And I was amazed that she's a, a relatively tiny, petite woman. And somehow in my mind, she was like eight feet tall she is you know. a force of nature <laughs> she really is she is yeah. and well she reached out to me via mm -hmm. linkedin with a with a random message that yeah. said hey we're forming this organization would you would you like to oh, join so and, you were there from right from the get-go uh oh. i'm not definitely not from the get-go i think i joined somewhere in the 70s so okay. uh it had started maybe about 18 to 24 months before okay i had joined but she had reached out and said would you be interested and and i didn't really know any Thing about it, but I'm like, well, what do mm -hmm. I have to lose? So yeah. I joined yeah. and um, became actively involved uh, well, in the organization. When and you and I mission. first met, you yep. were the uh, co chair of the events committee. Correct. I remember yeah. working with you. I think I was over in Ireland visiting family over there, and I was doing like a little, I showed up for one of the events you were doing and had yes. a few minutes. And so we were, that's how I knew your name, actually. <laughs> um, the uh, and I think what's interesting about that is the critical growth went to like sixty or seventy CXOs to more than eight hundred women now. Yes. The the T I, I would have to tease Suja that she needs a new name because the T two hundred it's like four times five times bigger than that now. Yeah, no, yeah. I think I think we might be close to a thousand if not over. Well, T one thousand is T one thousand. Let's mention that to her, right? <laughs> we yeah. do have a, a marketing and yeah. communication and branding teams. Well, so. and there's still such all a, volunteers. There's still such a need, though, to have Tremendous. more diversity and equity yeah. and inclusion. Uh, and you had mentioned it was just a passing comment earlier in our conversation. You said something about what a good job Gilbane already does yeah. with that. It's not so. You think of a construction and building company, and you imagine it would be just completely kind of white male dominated. But that is not your experience. That's a stereotype. Yeah, it's not been my experience really at all. I think mm -hmm. Gilbane has done done a wonderful job. And it comes back to the culture of caring. It, you know, Gilbane's culture of caring is all about um, caring for the people that you work with. So yes. we start every meeting with a Gilbane Cares moment where really? we share, That's yeah, so nice. we share, you yeah. know, uh, uh, safety related, mm -hmm. learning, health learning, concern about other folks. And it really does set the tone for how we work together and our yeah. social contract for how we are with each other. So it's a, it's a wonderful culture. It's a wonderful habit yeah. uh, that the organization is in. And part of that is valuing everybody in yeah. the organization, regardless of gender, background, identity, et mm -hmm. cetera. And um, real credit to the family, uh, the Gilbane family, you know, they lead by example. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have very sophisticated analytics on our diversity and inclusion, very active ERGs. I just recently took over as the, the executive sponsor for our Empower group, our women in construction team. Mm -hmm. um, and just a lot of cognizance around uh, the importance of inclusion. Yeah. Do you think that that is um, uh, an element of it being a family-owned company I, I, versus or privately held? And I think it, it, I don't know that I really can attribute that in mm -hmm. any particular way. I do okay. think the, you know, it does come down to the culture of caring mm -hmm. and it's, and it's really an extension yeah. of that. And as you know, I mean, there's no way to, to, plaster on a diversity, equity, inclusion, no, belonging No, you can't effort. just come up with a new mission statement no, and put exactly. it up on I mean, the wall. No, exactly. People really have to, yeah. if you want to do that, you really have to live it. And I think yeah. people know when that's not happening. And I don't mm -hmm. mean to portray it as, you know, Gilbane has solved all challenges. You know, we have our own pockets mm -hmm. of, of why are we doing this, as you yeah. can imagine. And I would be remiss for not mentioning that, that yeah. there are still 
challenges. But that's part of my responsibility as the executive chair is sure. beginning to clear those roadblocks. And I think that's what T200 mm-hmm. does for other folks. Like when I came into my new role in Gilbane, I had a wonderful conversation with one of our board members about, okay, first 90 days, make oh, sure good. you're not just taking a list from people, okay. right? Because you will set yourself up for failure. You have to be proactive about what you're going to focus on for oh. 90 days, right? So mm-hmm. just little tidbits, micro interactions, a um, lot of training and development mm-hmm. uh, through some of the partnerships that we now have. So it's really a wonderful organization. I'd encourage anybody to join. <laughs> Well, good. Well, good. Well, I, you know, and I'm very cognizant of the fact a lot of times CIOs who come on the show are there because they've got positions open in technology and they want to talk yeah. about the culture that they're working in and all. What do you have um, in terms of recruiting and finding the talent you need? Mm. Are you all full up and completely happy with the team you have? Or do you have areas where you're still looking for people in technology to join? Yeah, I think the areas where we will have growth are just in line with our strategic plan. So Mm -hmm. uh, cybersecurity and data in particular are two areas that um, that will be growing. Um, I'm really happy with the team that mm-hmm. we have. I think they've all stepped up in, uh, you know, the different leader yes. <laughs> setting different expectations. I think I've, I've been impressed at their flexibility mm-hmm. and willingness to, to opt in. That's great. Well, and you had mentioned too, when we talked earlier, that a lot of what you do is getting people to suspend disbelief. <laughs> So as we're as yeah. we're closing here, I want you to talk a little bit more about that. What you mean by that, and what's an example of a place where you where you got that done? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a it's a great question, and I think it is one of the benefits of coming from an industry that is further along on the transformation curve. Because mm-hmm. you know, when I started, um, and this was before my time, but there was a time in banking where banks would charge customers to use the ATM instead of going I in think to I see may the teller, right? That. I think yes. that was well, that was yes. before my time, but it. <laughs> so you know, okay, <laughs> and yours too, and no, uh, really, <laughs> yeah. All right, but now sixty mm-hmm. percent of balance changing transactions come through a mobile phone. Like that's something you would never predict. That's like if right. you went to those folks and said, "Hey, everyone's going to carry a little computer. It's about this size. It's that holds on their hand, yeah. right?" And so I think the suspension of disbelief has to happen early if you're going to scale innovations yeah. well. I remember one particular scenario when I was running a PMO mm-hmm. in a credit card business, and okay. a project came for prioritization for web collections. Bill and, collectors, like late bills, people Right, not, but yeah. this was going to be self-service. So if you were behind mm-hmm. and in collections, you could go online to this you know newfangled thing called the web yep. and... Um, submit your payment. And I'm thinking to myself, like, these are people who are not paying us anyway. Like, why? Like, we're it's, really going like to prioritize? Taking, uh, we're putting a lot of faith in the honor system here. Right. Like, we're we're going to prioritize this. Yeah. And, and it just seemed odd to me because it didn't mm-hmm. fit my existing mental map. And what I did mm-hmm. not appreciate was the nature of the interaction with the customer. It ended up being wildly successful yeah. because it's a much more psychologically safe experience for a customer to work through their payment plan mm-hmm. if they're in collections than to yeah. receive a call from a collector. And <sighs> and that's what I mean by suspending disbelief. So yes. I think, you know, when a, when a crazy idea comes to you, or mm-hmm. I should say an idea that you think does not have potential, okay. you have to examine your own underlying assumptions as to why you believe that to be true and potentially look at cross-industry examples of where, where and how it could be. Yeah. Well, and that's that's a wonderful example. I'm thinking of a similar one from a CIO I know in the restaurant industry when they started enabling people to just while they were waiting in line to order, they could have their they could do their order on their mobile phone. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a time a few years ago when that seemed like a crazy idea, and they found that people actually ordered more food. Because, oh, interesting. Because they didn't have to be at the counter with everybody listening to them saying, I'm going to supersize that. You right. know? They could do it right on their phone. It was, I mean, it was almost a privacy play in a way, and it was a huge percentage more. It was like people would order 40% more food or something, something truly ridiculous, mm-hmm. and every, you know, 
technology people who tried it out and they was like, wow, that really worked. Interesting. So, that's good. It's one of the things I love about technology executives just in general is mm-hmm. that your minds are cracked open to these kind of <laughs> possibilities. So thank you so much for joining me here today. I learned so much about the construction and building industry and just about all the amazing uh, innovation attitudes that you can have yeah. as you're out there and about. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. It was, it was great. If you joined us late today, do not despair. You can see the full episode of my conversation here today on LinkedIn, but also on CIO.com and on CIO's YouTube channel. CIO Leadership Live is also available as an audio podcast wherever you find your podcasts. And I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with CIO Karen Higgins Carter of Gilbane Company as much as I did. We will be back again next month on Wednesday, April 3rd at noon Eastern with Katrina Redmond, who is the CIO of Eaton Corporation. Please take a moment while you're filled with enthusiasm and gratitude for such a great show to subscribe to CIO's YouTube channel, where you can find more than 125 previous uh, episodes of CIO Leadership Live, as well as several international editions of the show that have podcasts featuring CIOs from Canada, India, New Zealand, and Australia. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we'll see you here next time.